if there's any trouble during the broadcast, just throw up a fist. Uh, you're, good. you're on. You're on. Yes. Okay. If you have any trouble or there's any any trouble going through, just throw up a fist, and I'll. I'm talking to you. Talking to you, Brother Dave, and the whole world, I guess, right? Okay. Well, I don't think it'd be a problem if we started just a minute or two early, do you? You're already on. I know. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Aaron Mitchell, the associate pastor at Berean Baptist Church, um, preaching again to an empty auditorium. Uh, just our uh, technical director, David Morris, is with us tonight. Um, it's not an easy thing with everything that's going on in the world to preach to an empty auditorium. Normally when, when I preach, um, and many other pastors and preachers and teachers would have probably agree to this, that when they preach, they normally feed off of the amens or the oh me's or the oh my's or, or the looks or the expressions of people's faces and the excitement, the encouragement, the discouragement sometimes. Um, it's hard when you're preaching um, to an audience that isn't there, or at least one you don't see personally. But tonight um, is typically the last Sunday night of the month. Um, I normally bring the sermon on a Sunday night, the last Sunday night of every month. Um, and tonight I'm going to uh, preach... Um, a sermon that is one that I've thought about for several months. Hopefully I can deliver it the way I'd like to, uh, that the point would be, uh, would come across to uh, many of the Christians that are out there because most of the people that aren't saved probably won't be tuning into this. Um, but the title of my sermon tonight is called Late in the Game. Late in the Game. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 15. Luke Chapter number 15, Luke chapter 15, verses number 11 through 32 is where we'll be tonight. Not sure if uh, how long um, it runs for a sermon, how long you actually are allowed to be on. Uh, we, there's a lot of things I don't know about this technology, but... Luke chapter number 15, verses 11 through 32. The Bible reads, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto, him, unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed some swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and he, they began to be merry. Verse 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. 
And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Pray with me, please, this evening. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to preach at Berean Baptist Church. I don't take it lightly. Lord, I ask now that your Holy Spirit would move to those that are listening and watching online. We can't gather as a church right now, Lord. There's a lot of things going on in the world, a lot of uncertainty, but there's a few things we can be certain about. Number one, you're there. And number two, you love us. And you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Now, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would move and that I'd be a vessel, Lord, that would just maybe help someone tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's plea is really a plea for the Christian who's walked away from God. How many times have we asked God for a blessing? How many times have we asked God to meet a need? How many times, I know personally I have, how many times have you made the so-called deal with God? God, if you give me this, I'll do this for you. Lord, if you, if you make sure you meet my need here, then I'll be totally sold out for you. Tonight is for sinners, not for people who are perfect. There's going to be no room for those people tonight. Tonight's for the people who have backslidden once or twice in their life. For those who are backslidden now. For those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but there's been no sign of salvation, this is for them tonight. Those who have wasted their substance. <clears throat> This is also for the Christian who at most times thinks they're better than others. Hopefully this will be a lesson to many of us tonight. I believe this is applicable to all of us. But tonight I want to start in the first few verses, verses number 11 through 13. I want you to notice something that the Bible says a certain man in verse number 11 had two sons. I want you to notice they're both sons. I believe both of these men are saved. I believe the parable is that of a Christian who's gotten away from the Lord. They're both sons. In verse number 12, I want you to notice that he made a deal with his dad. Like many of us have made a deal with God, at least I have. Maybe I'm the only one here tonight who said, Lord, if you just meet the need now, I'll serve you with my whole heart, knowing that I could never live up to that. Verse number 13 shows where he got what God, what he wanted from his father or God. The deal was struck, but he took the blessing and he ran into a far country. Bible says in there he wasted his substance with riotous living. Another lesson I guess you could pull out of this is how many times has God blessed us with more than we deserve and we've turned around and wasted it and squandered it on our own selves. Look, I'm talking to people who are human tonight. People that make mistakes. If you don't, if you don't fall into that category, you probably want to go listen to something else. The self-righteous sermon. But I want you to notice something. 
Sometimes we forget where the blessing comes from. So if you would, please, I want you to look at my first point tonight. It says, my first point would be, God, give me. God, give me. And I believe that's the mentality of this son tonight right off the bat. See, he's a son. He's a saved man. And all he wants to do is get from God. He wants the inheritance. He wants the blessing, but he doesn't want to give back. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 13. Proverbs chapter number 13. Proverbs 13, I'm going to let the Bible do the speaking tonight. A wise son heareth his father in verse number one. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a a scorner heareth not rebuke. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his own mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. Be careful what you ask for. God may just give it to you. A lot of people have wanted to be wealthy. A lot of people can handle it. Some can't. Be careful, because if you get rich, you may have nothing but your money. I know many, many people that are retired and are very wealthy, and yet they have nothing. Oh, they have money, they have boats, they have cars, but yet they have no family, they have no friends, they have nothing. They have no salvation, they have nothing. There is that There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. The light of the righteousness rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Verse number 11, I want you to notice this. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You know, maybe we shouldn't just always ask God for every little thing. Maybe we should go out and work with our own hands and gather up things. Because if we always got what we wanted, we would end up being somewhat spoiled like this son. God give me is what he said. Give me my inheritance now. I'd rather have my blessing here on earth right now. Wait a minute. I'd rather have my blessing in heaven, in heaven. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 10. Go back left in your Bible, one page, at least in mine. Chapter number 10, verse number one, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. How many mothers have stayed away at, awake at night worrying over their children? But a father, when his son does well, is proud and brags. Look at this, my son. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Listen, if God gave us everything all the time that we asked, we would just squander it, most of us, if we were honest with ourselves, like this son, like he did. He went and blew all his inheritance. You know, it's important to give an inheritance to your children and your children's children. But that isn't always a financial inheritance. We should be passing down a godly inheritance as well. One where we pass down the word of God to our children and our children's children. But I want you to notice something. Skip down to verse number 12. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. Listen, I believe God can restore the Christian. I believe God can restore the one who's walked away from him. 
I believe the Lord can save the lost. God is not willing that any, any should perish, but all should come to repentance. All should turn to him. All. But not everybody will. So the first thing I want to, you to notice tonight is, I'd, I'd kind of, if I were to label him, would be the spoiled Christian. God, give me. God, I don't want to really work for it. I'd rather stay at home, just drop it in my lap. And many, unfortunately, religions today have this prosperity religion where if you just pray for it, God's just going to give it to you. And God could. The Bible says the, the uh, earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is all God's. All things were created by him. All things consist because of him. But God wants you to be diligent. But a lot of times God will give you what you ask. Sometimes you can learn a lesson. Turn back to Luke. Turn back to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. You know, unfortunately, too many Christians in America, when things go wrong, they just want to get down on their knees and ask God to meet their financial needs right away, even though they've never darkened the doors of a church, they never picked up his word, they've never done anything for the Lord. And then they call on him in distress, and he's, he's there. But there's some things that need to be done on that way. Luke 15, verse number 14, the Bible reads, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. I'm not going to go into the chastening of the Lord and how sometimes he corrects people and will draw them back. And, you know, I, I personally have been uh, spanked by God multiple times in my life. It's not a beating I enjoy, but it's always good for me. But at the end of it all, what I've learned is my second point. God can restore you. Why? Because he loves us. He's our father. God can restore you. Verse number 14, you need to realize where you're at, though. And this son realized where he was. He realized that he was in a far country and there was a famine taking place, and he had nothing to eat. He had nothing. He had spent everything he had. His entire inheritance, he had spent on riotous living. And then when the trouble came, he had nothing. And I believe a lot of times God brings trouble to draw us back to rely on him. Why? Because he can restore us, and he can restore you. How do, how do we know what kind of situation we're in, whether it's of God or whether God's chasing us? A lot of time you can answer that question better yourself. You know if you're doing something that's going to cause God to want to draw you back to him and chasing you. Let's be honest with ourselves tonight. We live in a world where there's very little honesty anymore. And there's rarely any integrity. And if we were honest with ourselves tonight, we would all agree that there's something we need to improve in our life, each one of us. And like I said, tonight is not for the Christian who's arrived. It's for the ones who need to be restored. And if you're honest and your heart's in the right place, every one of us needs to be restored at all times. And you know what? He's waiting to restore you. He's waiting to restore you. Verse number 17 in Luke chapter 15, and when he came to himself, when he realized what he had done, he said, how many hired servant of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? Don't fight God. 
Don't fight God. Go back to him. I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And I like how the Bible then says, but when he was yet a great way off. Why? Because God is looking for you to return to him. He's wanting you to come back to him. He's waiting for you as you're a far way off from him. He's looking for your return. He doesn't even get to make it to his house when the Bible says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. See, because when he came to his soul, when he came to himself in verse number 17, he was repentant. He knew he had to turn back to God. He was already saved. He was a son. He knew he had to come back. He knew he had made mistakes as a Christian. And if I were honest with you, I've made many mistakes as a Christian. Many. And I'm not done either. I'm sure I'll make many more. I'm sure I will, even though I'd like not to. I am just a man. He had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But get this. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. You know, one of the best parts of being restored back to God is you being merry in your soul and in your spirit. You coming back to the Lord and the sweet fellowship you can now have with God. It's about a relationship with God. And that relationship was hindered, and now it's back. And you can rejoice in the Lord. The Bible says to re rejoice in the God of your salvation in the book of Isaiah. Rejoice in the God of your salvation. And the best part about rejoicing with God when he restores you is he can make things right. Turn to Joel chapter number two. Joel chapter number two in your Old Testament. It's a minor prophet. Joel chapter number two. Joel chapter number two. There's a couple things that are important when you as a Christian get things right with God. Number one, it can restore your testimony. And then it can restore your inheritance or your heritage. Joel chapter number two, verse number 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? And leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Everybody should rejoice when the Lord restores someone. When someone comes here to our church and they haven't been in church for a while and they come in and they've been out in the world and they've wasted their heritage on riotous living and they've made many mistakes, we should welcome them with open arms and we should say, hey, come in here, get restored and God will give a blessing and we should sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation in verse 16, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach. Return it, Lord. Return it to this man or woman who's gotten away from you. And that heathen should rule over them. 
Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? If your testimony is shot and you're in the gutter today and you're not having any of your prayers answered and the Lord's not meeting with you, many of your neighbors who aren't saved, where's his God? He claims to have a God, but yet look, he can't even make ends meet. Everything falls apart in his life. But the great testimony turns for the better down in verse number 25 of Joel chapter number 2. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty. Hey, let's kill the fatted calf because God's going to restore the years to you, Christian, that the locusts have eaten. God can restore you tonight. He can bring back all the years that, as the song says, years I've wasted in vanity and pride. Carry not, my Lord was crucified. Listen, we can get those years returned to us. Verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied because when you're out in the world, you're never going to be satisfied. When you get all the money that the world has to offer, all the fame that the world has to offer, you end up with nothing. That's why so many people in Hollywood kill themselves. Robin Williams, the drug overdoses, the continual divorces and remarriages and adulteries and fornications, they're never satisfied. Never. Because that stuff doesn't satisfy you. You'll be satisfied if you can get restored back to the Lord and he returns unto you what the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. Verse 26, And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Listen to me tonight, Christian. If you've been backslidden and you've gotten away from God, come back, get right with God. Be ashamed of what you've done, but know that God has wiped that away and given you a new slate. Don't wallow in it. Don't glory in it. Just forget about it and get moving on for the Lord tonight. Never, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Why? Because we're just human beings. We make mistakes. You know, sometimes we're hard on ourselves, and we need to remember Adam and Eve were perfect, and they sinned, right? And yet sometimes we'll beat a brother or sister in Christ down because they've gotten caught up in sin, Hey, he who thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Lest he fall. Hey, prideful person who thinks they do nothing wrong. Pride cometh before the fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Be careful. Peter wrote, the same afflictions which are accomplished in you are accomplished in the brethren. He was not a high priest that felt not our infirmities. Jesus knew, and I believe that's why he wants to restore you. He knows. He knows. Turn right in your Bible to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter number 7. God can restore you. Verse number 18 of Micah 7, if you turn right in your Bible from Joel chapter number 2. Who is God in verse number 18? Who is a God like unto thee? that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. The inheritance. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. mercy. Thank God he delights in mercy. Right? Because for by grace are we saved through faith. faith. But yet as a Christian, once we're saved... It's only by his mercy, it's by his mercy that when we sin and get away from him, he doesn't just call you home. But I, I'm going to throw this disclaimer out. Be careful because God has called people home who have gotten caught up in serious sin. Read 1 John chapter number 5, I believe it's verse 
16, the Bible does say there's a sin unto death, and I do say you should not pray for it. Be careful, because there is some things that a person can do that God has to bring them home, and I believe it's for their own good. I really do. But see, here's the thing. He delighteth in mercy. He wants you to get on your knees and get back and get right with him. Verse 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. The last thing I'd like to do is stand before God and be reminded of what I did when I stand before him. Sometimes when I think about when I die and go to heaven or if I'm taken away in the rapture, sometimes I think to myself, what's it going to be like? Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I hope when I die or I'm raptured, whichever one comes first, I see those in that great cloud of witnesses, those that have gone on to be with the Lord before me. And I can't wait to see Jesus, who paid it all on a cruel, rugged cross. Verse number four of Hebrews 12 says, have you resisted unto blood, striving against sin? We can resist. Once you get restored, get in this book and resist. He'll cast away our sins into the depths of the sea. Turn to Psalm 103. Psalm 103 in your Bible. Turn left in your Bible to the book of Psalms. It's in the middle of most Bibles. Psalm 103, verse number 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever, thank God. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Oh, and I'm glad he hasn't nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Get this, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. I want you to notice something tonight in your Bible. Turn back to Luke 15. As that verse said, the Lord pitieth his children. He didn't say child. There's two children in this story tonight. And I want to talk about the second one briefly. My third point is, why can't we forgive like Jesus? See, Christian, sometimes it's easy for us to sit in our ivory towers behind the walls of our church, think we're doing really well tonight, and there's a world that's slipping into hell. People are dying every second and they're slipping into hell. They're slipping into hell. And yet we can't even forgive our own brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 25, now his elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh to the house and he heard music and dancing. And he should have said, wow, my dad's throwing a party, a feast. I better hurry up and clean myself up and join the feast. But that's not what the Bible says. And he called one of the servants in verse 26 and asked what these things meant. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And the Bible should say, and the brother was rejoicing and happy that his brother came back, and he was going to serve the Lord with him, and he was going to get things right, and God was going to share and shed mercy on him, and he was going to serve the Lord with him, and they were going to do great and mighty works for God. But in verse 28, the Bible does not say that. It says, and he was was angry and would not go in. And how many times has somebody come to church and maybe they've got one too many tattoos or maybe they smell like uh, they've been drinking or maybe they, they smell like they've been smoking and, and you just shun them and you just walk away from them once you've hugged them and you say, I better not touch that person again. Right? For years. 
in churches I've heard, oh, they don't look the part. They, they, they don't wear a suit. They don't have the money. They were in sin for a long time. Instead of rejoicing that they're getting ready to put their life on the right track and God's going to restore to them the kingdom and God's going to uh, cook a feast and have, have, have a great time rejoicing for one sinner that repents. He wouldn't even... He wouldn't even go in. Verse 29, and, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Hey, why can't we forgive like Jesus? Why can't we rejoice when a backslidden Christian or someone who's been carried away in vanity and pride, caring not the Lord was crucified, gets right with God, repents, comes back, turns over a new leaf, gets right with God, starts reading their Bible? Why can't we rejoice with them? As a young Christian, I made this mistake myself several times. I believe this brother felt like he deserved more because he was more faithful. I felt like he probably realized, well, what's the point of going to church all these years if you're just going to let this guy come in at the last second and take everything? I was the one that was faithful, Father. I was the one that did everything you wanted. Yet you never did anything for me like that. But what he didn't realize was, guess what? Guess what? Verse 31, and he said unto him, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. Listen, Christian, you have the peace of God because you're not off in sin. You ought to be thankful for that. You ought to be thankful that you're in church. You ought to be thankful that you're not caught up in a bunch of sin. You ought to be thankful that your relationship with God is a good one. And you ought to be willing and ready to forgive others like Jesus has forgiven you. Jesus didn't deserve to go to the cross, and yet he went for you. Jesus didn't deserve to be beat, spit upon, beard plucked out, crown of thorns placed upon his head, drove down, beat into his brow. He didn't deserve to sit out there in the heat of the day, hands nailed to a cruel rugged cross. He didn't deserve that, yet he did it for you. And why can't we forgive like him? Turn to Ezekiel chapter number three quickly in your Bible, Ezekiel chapter number three. I want you to notice something. I'm, I'm just turning there quickly. I'm just going to read it for the sake of time. Ezekiel chapter number three, verse number eight. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thy ears and go get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they forbear. He's, he's saying, hey, Christian, hey, preacher, go get strong in the word of God and preach. But just like I did early on in my Christian walk, I made a big mistake. Look at verse number 14. So the spirit lifted me up of verse 14 and took me away and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my own spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. We got to be careful not to make mistakes trying to restore people and do it in bitterness, in the heat of our own spirit. We may know the Bible. God gives us the opportunity to hear the word and to put it in our heart and go out and preach it and teach it. And we should preach hard on certain things, but we should always remember the people we're preaching to. You know, one of the hardest things to do is to preach to people when you know they're having family trouble 
And there's things that you need to preach on for the benefit of the whole flock. But you need to remember something. Just like in the Old Testament, when Moses would preach hard, even Aaron, his two sons got away from the Lord and brought strange fire unto the Lord. And they were put to death. They were put to death. And the Bible says Aaron held his peace. Think of the think of sometimes we need to think of the parents sometimes when we preach. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll pull no punches preaching hard against sin and things that are destroying our nation. But I never want to forget the people that I'm preaching to. I want to restore them. If Adam and Eve had two two children, one slew the other, and they had family trouble and they were perfect, they sinned, and then it trickled down through their kids. We need to remember to have compassion. We should, let's turn back to Luke chapter number 15. We should rejoice with together with those that return. We should be happy for them when they get restored. We should encourage them, pick them up. <clears throat> Verse 32, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I just want you to bear with me for a moment. I'm going to tell a story. Um, I'm going to tell a story that uh, something I'll never forget. Many in, many in my immediate family remember this story. If you just bear with me as I tell it. My brother and I grew up together, um, kind of like these two brothers did. Played a lot of baseball. Matter of fact, we lived baseball. We ate, slept, drank baseball. We'd fight over the sports page in the morning to read every unimportant stat from every player on every team. So I guess I was about 13 or 14. He was 11 or 12-ish. Can't remember the exact ages. My dad got laid off his job on the railroad and joined the Army. And we were moved out to uh, Washington State, Fort Lewis, the Army base. <clears throat> it's hard to play baseball in a state that's considered the rain state, right? But we love baseball nonetheless. At this time, my dad was at the game. He wasn't in Yakima, the desert, where they did their training. He was able to attend this ball game. And my cousin came from Chillicothe, Ohio, to watch as well. Bear with me with this story. My brother, who was younger than me, was playing probably one of the best games he had played that entire season. He had gone six for six. It was a great game. He went six for six, stole bases, made great defensive plays. He was motivating. He was very fast. I don't think he's as fast now, neither. I was never fast. He would steal bases, make great defensive plays. I, on the other hand, was playing probably one of the worst games of my life. Struck out several times, maybe popped up. I can't remember exactly. Can't remember exactly how the game was going. But the game was coming to an end, and we were down by three. And I believe it was the last eight and ninth batter had gotten out, and my brother was lead off. And I believe he hit a base hit, and then he stole second. I can't remember if the next two guys were walked or if one had gotten a hit. I can't remember that far back. But the bases were loaded, and there were two outs. And I was playing the worst game of my life in front of my dad and my cousin and even my brother who had outshined me greatly that day.
And with two outs and the bases loaded, I was able to hit a ball that went over the fence. Now, my cousin seems to think it went through the fence even to this day. That's disputable. But the ball was considered a home run. And we won by one run. And as I rounded the bases and I was coming home, and my brother had played the best game that he had played that entire year probably, when I got there, he wasn't sitting over in the corner. He wasn't off to the side going, you just stole my glory. He was jumping up and down because we won. We won. And the example is not because he or I did well, but because we won the game. We need to be more concerned with the outcome of the game of life than we do our own statistics and how we live and who we think we're better than. When I crossed home plate, I didn't, we didn't care who went six for six or who went 0 for five in the final hit. We won. And let me tell you something, if we're saved, we all win. We all win. And whether you return to the Lord now or a few years from now, or you return to the Lord years ago, or you never left the Lord, we're still on the same team. And we need to work together and remember that. Because we won the game. And we were rejoicing together. He wasn't angry. He deserved the game ball that day. And there are many Christians that are darkening the doors of churches that deserve the game ball. And the one Christian comes in late in life and God restores unto him the same reward as he does those that have sat faithful. And instead of being angry, we should realize we're on the same team. We have social distanced far too long from this world as Christians. I'm not talking about because of the coronavirus. I'm talking about as Christians, we've sat away far too long. And we need to realize there's a game being played and we need to win. And whether you're a faithful Christian your entire life or one who's just stepped into the game, and you're getting ready to hit a home run and lead people to the Lord, remember this, if you're saved, we all win. We all win. And I'm glad and I'm thankful that my brother came back to the Lord. He had gotten away for several years and I'm glad I was at a place in my life where I, I wasn't how I was years ago where I could have been judgmental and said, well, you didn't do this right or you didn't do that right. Instead, I was rejoicing with him and I wasn't angry. And I hope he and his family get more of an inheritance than I get in heaven because I don't care. I'm happy with what God's going to give me. I'm happy with the peace I have right now. I'm happy with the ability to talk to you tonight. And I just ask as Christians that we realize where we all come from, and that we're all sinners, saved by grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to bring your word. I thank you for the many things, good and bad, that have happened in my life. Lord, I'm thankful for the chastisement when I got away from you, and I'm thankful for the patience and the peace that you've given me through reading your word. Lord, I just ask that you would help each one of us to get in your word and grow stronger and gather together and realize what team we are on, the same team. And that we all join together to win. And Lord, let us all fix our testimonies. That should be something every Christian does every day is how can my testimony get better? How can I get better serving you, Lord? How can I build my relationship back with you, Father? And the Christian who's humble and their heart's right with God knows that 
even in their best efforts, they're far away. And they've got to draw close to him every day. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Lord, help us all to die daily to the flesh that we may draw nigh with our spirit. Lord, I thank you for this church, the opportunity you've given me, the freedom that we have in this great nation. Lord, even with all of its imperfections, America is the greatest nation on earth, I believe. Lord, I thank you for allowing me to be born here. Help me to be a better Christian and all those in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.